Orange Crate. Well, welcome friends. This is Christine Ashley. I'm the Quaker Field Secretary here at the Friends Committee in National Legislation. And I'm so happy that you all were able to join us as we delve into the future of Quakers with two public Quakers known far and wide for their gifts in articulating Friends spirit-led practices in the world through their writings and their speaker engaging engagements and their activist works in the world. Liz Nicholson and Marge Abbott will be speaking with you friends about their experiences and perspectives for about 20 minutes and then we'll open to sharing questions and stories from those attending tonight's event. Um, here are some of the queries we pose for tonight's discussion. And you can see them on the uh, right there on the slide. I'm going to read them for friends who are on the phone right now. What gifts do Quakers have to share with others? in these harrowing times? How do we practice listening and attending to the spirit within? How are friends meetings and organizations helping individuals recognize and encourage the inward transformation so essential to growing prophetic ministries? And finally, how are contemporary friends lifting and sustaining love and witness in our public lives? What else can be done? We look forward to seeing what unfolds during this evening's event. It's just wonderful to be here with so many of you. I see that we have 194 people joining us this evening from all across the country. How magnificent is that? Uh, Bobby Trice is our Quaker Outreach Young Fellow. He's running our technology tonight. And before we jump in, we're gonna go ahead and review a few technology housekeeping items and explain how you can submit a question or, st or story during the event tonight. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Christine, for opening us up. Um, I just wanted to go over a few technology features that we have available to us in Zoom. Um, so as you can see from the slide displayed now, the chat bar is going to be the main way that the audience members here in this webinar can interact with us and with one another. So feel free to, um, if you want to ask the panelists a question or share something from your own experience, feel free to write in that chat, as many of you have already been doing, identifying where you're tuning in from, what your meeting affiliation is, anything like that. Um, just when you are asking a question or submitting a story, please uh, include your name, your location, and uh, your monthly meeting or church or Quaker community so that we can announce that along with your question. Um, also, uh, I want to call attention to who you address your chats to because there are a few different options in the drop down menu in the chat bar. Um, you can private message me, the Quaker Welcome Center, if you have a specific question tech related, or you can address a question directly to the panelists. But if you want everyone to see what you have to share, then you have to address it to all panelists and all attendees as well. I think that is um, all of the technology that I wanted to cover and I'll turn it back to Christine. Thank you so much. Well, I just wanted to go ahead right away to introduce friends to our two panelists tonight. You may already know of them and we already have an extended friendship with them. You may not know the extent of the ways that they have moved throughout the Quaker world Liz Nicholson grew up and was nurtured by West Richmond Friends and First Friends Meetings in Richmond, Indiana. And she graduated from Guilford College where she was active in the Quaker Leadership Scholars Program on campus. And Liz served as a fellow in the first Quaker Voluntary Service, QVS cohort. And uh, she was in the house in Atlanta in 2012. And at that time, that's when she started and became so active in Atlanta Friends Meeting. So shout out to all the Atlanta friends who are on here with us tonight accompanying Liz. Her justice work and activism led her to work with Friends Committee on National Legislation. Uh, and she's also had extensive working relationships with adults with intellectual and development disabilities, and also alongside Quakers in Palestine and Israel. Our second panelist, Marge Abbott, is currently writing and traveling in the ministry with the support of Multnomah Monthly Meeting in Portland, Oregon. And she is currently our FCNL friend, not in Washington. We were so much anticipating her presence with Carl in Washington, DC. And we're so pleased that she is still able to continue her, nurture, her nurturing of FCNL staff and constituents. 
So Marge has published widely, and many of you will have read some of her works, but we're here tonight really referencing her 2018 book, Walk Humbly, Serve Boldly, Modern Quakers as Everyday Prophets. And her concern for making friends' voices heard more widely in the world take her regularly to Washington, D.C., where she's served as presiding clerk of Friends Committee on National Legislation. Marge regularly offers workshops on discernment, support and clearness committees, and prophetic ministry among friends. So we're going to begin with Marge, who's going to speak of her perspective on the queries uh, that we have um, referenced earlier. Thank you. Anyway, I thank you, Christine, for that lovely introduction. And I just want to start out by saying I keep finding myself uh, talking about the world in a different way, given what's going on around us and referencing the world as it was. The world as it was, I'd be in Washington, D.C. This is what I've been planning on happening for a year or more, that we would be up on the hill and getting to meet all these wonderful folk face to face and really engaging in a much more wide ranging way. The world as it is, we're in Portland, Oregon, and we're doing what we can by Zoom. And since we're doing a lot of writing, we can do a certain amount, but it's really different. The world as it will be, we can all keep guessing about that. But I think, you know, trying to work out specific answers isn't right necessarily the right thing right now. It's how do we approach this whole new world, whatever comes out of this experience with the virus? And I think it's the most important things for friends not to forget are, are um, things like the importance of relationships and need to keep building them. And right, this is something that was, comes out in Anna's song that that's really core. And it's also important to remember that we carry within our community a vision, a vision for the world to be, a vision of the peaceful kingdom. You might call it the city of God, the kingdom of God. There are many ways to name it. But this place where people care for people, where there's a place of justice, and the vulnerable are most protected. And we learn to resolve this, our differences nonviolently. There's many dimensions to this vision, but it's a beautiful vision. And this vision of the world as it might be may seem a little idealistic at times, but I want to point back to the fact that in the mid 17th century, when Quakers were formed in England, was a time when there was a major civil war in England, a very bloody civil war, and the king was beheaded <laughs> at the end of it. Um, there was a plague that swept across England at the time the friends were being formed. They were dealing with the same disease problems, of, you know, variations, but same disease kind of problems that we are. And on top of it all, the city of London burned almost to the ground. <laughs> they were coming out of a very harsh environment. Yet they could, you have George Fox saying that if you know that inward power of God and live with that and follow it, you can come to walk cheerfully over the earth, answering that of God in every person. And when you look at the circumstances, I find that to be a really powerful vision. And so how do I see Quakers today? Well, I've come to start calling us a band of everyday prophets. And so what do I mean by this in terms of prophets? I'm not talking about the folks who are foretelling the future. That's not what we're all about. I'm not talking about people just really focused on the news and the details of what, who did what to whom. I am talking about a people 
who, whether they're Quaker, call themselves Quaker or not, uh, have learned to listen deep within and learn to recognize that voice of the spirit that tells them of a different way and opens up potential for creativity and a process of really revisioning the world and being part of a new creation. And some actions may be, may be dramatic, but really it's the small things, the ordinary things, everyday things that we do that are really, really important. And such actions might be really not very visible to the world. And here I'll just share a small story of uh, Rachel, one of the members of our meeting, who for years worked to end the death penalty, which was really good work that she was doing. But then she, as she kept listening and listening, she realized that she had to do one-on-one -on -one speaking, listening to people and speaking with people who were involved in the process, not only the families of those who had been murdered, the talking to people who incarcerated for having committed murder, talking to people who are part of the um, police force, the enforcement agencies that had to be called to a site and seen the bloody bodies, the circumstances that are very traumatizing. And she found herself being, in many ways, it sounded like being a minister to these people and helping them connect back to that spark of God within and to live in a different way and to find some healing and make them, self, make them different kinds of participants in our justice system. So the everyday prophet is one of very ordinary people around us listening for the source of love and truth in the universe as their recipe for life. And to say that, talk about this in a slightly different way, um, these, there's three dimensions. One is discernment. Discernment is central. Can I sort out my motivations and see what is of God and what comes from greed or fear? Do I recognize the sources of the various voices in my head that are pushing me in different directions and sometimes contrary, contradictory ones and pulling me away from what is right. But once I hear that voice of the light and really recognize it, am I willing to act? It's really poor. And as I look at the world around me, can I see what is life-giving and draw it out in others? Those are three functions of the everyday prophet. And we're part of a prophetic community. And I think we need to see ourselves as a whole community contributing to this. And part of that everyday process of it and the ordinariness of it. And that comes with carrying the vision that hope many of us, as many as possible, will help to make visible. But we also have many practices that we don't have time to go into, but um, for per, per personal discernment, for making decisions as a community. These are really rich practices that we have that help us live out this vision of the world. And one of the things that helps me is um, like in the book, uh, Paul Buckley suggested, we think about ourselves as people as uh, part of like a baseball players. And remembering that even the best baseball players in the world, you know, world, if they have a batting average where they're hitting, they're getting a hit one third of the time, they're considered great. And nobody's shooting for a thousand percent. We tend to trip ourselves up by shooting for a thousand percent all the time. <laughs> Remembering that, you know, we're gonna fail a certain amount. And all we can do is pick ourselves up and try again. And in fail, and we fail again. We need to bring some more people in around to help us with the discernment, help us with support and accountability. So there's a lot of a lot of pieces in there. And each meeting of friends 
um, I can see as a different kind of band of everyday profits. It'll have a different flavor. So if you look at your meeting community, are they a jazz band and like to improvise? <laughs> are they a symphony orchestra that has a lot of precision and huge number of people can, you know, coordinating their music and are they um, into rock bands or a, a string quartet, Beethoven or the Beatles, you know, there are lots and lots of different qualities and that we can learn to cherish them all and their very differences. And as individuals, we each have a role with our own unique role that we bring to this that could be playing the piccolo, playing the strings, you know, violins, playing the tuba, you know, take your, find what is your place within this larger band. So together, uh, in summary, I'd just like to say that as um, when we play together, we can sing a song of hope and tell of what it's like to be filled with the spirit. We can carry with us an awareness of God, even at the edges of turmoil. We can actively resist being driven, driven by fear, not be dominated by self-will, and know that it all will not be easy or simple. But if we're open to unimagined possibilities, you know, some of them might occur. This is my vision for the future of Friends. Thank you so much, Marge. I know we have uh, questions coming through and I say keep them coming, I'm noting them. Uh, we're going to proceed to Liz Nicholson and then after Liz Nicholson presents her story um, and her vision, uh, we're gonna open up to questions. Thank you. Hi, can you all hear me? All right, great. Uh, I'm Liz, I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I'm, I'm so grateful to be here and I feel deeply excited about this conversation in particular. Um, I started thinking about what, what makes me so excited and um, I was thinking back to when I was a student at Guilford College and I remember studying early friends like George Fox and Margaret Fell and John Woolman and still feel so excited and moved by the examples of early Quakers in their radical movement to shed outward sacraments and practices that didn't feed or nurture their connection to spirit or to each other. Um, I think about our Quaker meetings now, uh, where we are presently and the ways in which we continue to be countercultural spaces of radical change. Um, silent waiting worship and space for communities to listen for what spirit is asking of us, um, both as individuals and as communities, um, and creating what we might call a beloved community, or as Marge shared, um, what, are, what is our prophetic vision that we're leaning into and creating together. Um, I, I want to share that I'm speaking very much from my experience and lens as a white cisgender Quaker woman who has mostly been a part of very active meetings and um, Quaker programming opportunities for young adults. Um, these spaces have been such formative experiences in my life um, and my spirituality. And I feel really passionately about continuing to invite young adults more deeply into Quaker spaces um, and take part in conversations about intergenerational community and action um, and justice work within the Religious Society of Friends and, and sort of the, the dual nature of um, the work that we have to do within our spaces and then this sort of bigger question of what tools might we have to offer to other spaces who are also doing justice work and um, responding in the moment of crisis. Um, it has been a, a deep joy and honor to have worked with um, Quaker Voluntary Service um, over the past seven years, um, first as a fellow in the program um, and later as staff in our work of creating a program and experiment for young adults to live into the intersections of justice work and community um, and spirituality, which is nurtured by local Quakers and within the Quaker way. Um, 
the piece of that work that has been like particularly life-giving for me has been the work of introducing or inviting folks more deeply into Quaker practices, into Quaker meetings and into the tools and physical spaces um, as a place for personal growth and transformation in our lives. Um, this feels really critical to me because I believe that our spiritual lives are undoubtedly connected to the ways that we show up in our wider communities and our work for justice and equity. Um, I feel like they can't reasonably be separated um, from each other if we want to live sustainable lives and that are grounded in spirit um, in, in my experience. Um, I think I thinking a lot about sort of in this societal moment of responding to coronavirus and the crisis and the slowing down, um, we do, as friends do have tools and practices um, and experience in leaning into that uncomfortable edge um, and being present in the slowness and quiet in deep listening um, and familiarity and asking the question like, what does love require of us? Um, what does love require of us in this moment? Um, what is the work that is uniquely mine? Um, and then another step of accountability or, or the next step is what, what do I need to do that? Um, and, and the fact that those questions don't happen in isolation, but that they happen with the support and accountability of community, which uh, these days is often digital, which is a little harder, but is still, um, it's still so present um, and, and accessible. Um, and, and for some, and for many, more accessible than ever right now, which I want to lift up. Um, it's been really powerful to see the impact um, of that fellow's lives and uh, the way that they explore intersections of spirituality and community. And I want to speak to a couple of tools that I, um, as a young adult, have felt incredibly excited about and um, feel um, really passionately that these are spaces that um, help us to be, remain agile um, and remain responsive and more intentional in the ways that we invite and deepen relationship uh, within our Quaker meetings and spaces. Um, the first tool I want to talk about is uh, clearness committees um, as a practice that feels really timely and essential in this moment. Um, and and not necessarily in a sort of formal, let's gather a clearness committee process, but some of the, the pieces that go into that process feel really important right now. I think clearness committees as a part of our um, cultural community um, strengthens our ability to listen to our inward teacher and to be present with others in a space of non-judgment. Um, I feel like it grounds us in our ability to feel guided by our own values and more able to tune out pressures of society, of individualism, of capitalism, of um, and the sort of rest of the heteronormative patriarchy that um, can be really influential in the ways that we make our decisions and the ways that we're in relationship with others. Um, clearness committees also invite us into a space of loving communion with others, which makes space for deep vulnerability, um, to be seen and, and to be met with love and respect. Um, which increases our ability to be generous with each other and with ourselves um, in the many ways that we experience life. Um, our ability to be vulnerable with each other is also essential in meeting and honoring that of God in ourselves and others. Um, it's embracing all that is human and not putting weight or value on emotions that are more or less desirable um, in our, our sort of cultural norms. Um, and more importantly, I think most importantly, this tool uh, teaches us to ask better questions. Um, it teaches us to ask open questions without the presumption of knowing what the answer might be. Um, and without, uh, and in a way to listen, uh, to discern a way forward from a place of centeredness and values, um, rather than I think a need that I see rise in myself to give advice sometimes where that's, that's not helpful um, often. Um, but it's, it's more of a, a coming to our own consensus. Um, and as an example of um, how I've seen this happen um, in QVS, we invite fellows to participate in clearness committee processes. And those have really covered the gamut of issues from uh, a decision to go to grad school or a decision to move in with a partner, um, a relationship with a parent, um, 
or something more abstract but equally powerful of like my relationship to food and abundance and and this this is a space to really um invite others to help us see the blocks in ourselves that we might have um or our blinders in in our decision making and moving forward um in worship i think i'm moving on to a different tool that feels relevant um in worship and decision making um quakers often emphasize the role of community we believe that communities are usually better at discerning and expressing truth than any one individual acting in isolation um, and we tend to trust that something is deeply true when it brings us together um, and of course, Quakers aren't the only ones to see power in the relationships that bind us together. Um, I'm thinking of Adrienne Marie Brown in Emergent Strategy um, and how she reflects on what ecosystems can teach us about the concept of interdependence. Um, an ecosystem supports life because every part is in relationship with every other part and that there's a truth that lives in these relationships and that they're dynamic and reciprocal and that and that isn't always apparent when we're isolated. Um, yeah, I think um, the last sort of thing that I think is really powerful that I want to um, bring into this conversation is um, the power in intergenerational community building and how important that's been in my life as a young friend who um, has been a part of many Quaker spaces. Um, and and also as a person who has invited other young adults into Quaker, imperfect Quaker spaces as they all are. and. Um, as we're growing and, and deepening. Um, I think this can sometimes look, uh, it's, it's, it's complex and I think that I've experienced a lot of ageism in times and I think one of the things that um, has been so beautiful and is when older friends have trusted me and have encouraged me to, and have asked me deeper questions in how I can show up fully uh, in that sort of meeting that of God in every person. And so I've seen this happen in spiritual nurturing and mentoring relationships um, as a space for deep questioning, um, for trying things on, and a space to fail and to try again. Um, it's also been an incredibly important practice for me in gift naming um, and in seeing and testing where our gifts align with the needs um, as well as a space of accountability in, in like what it means to be a steward of those gifts. Um, which has been really powerful. Um, I think a lot about, uh, as a young person, um, reading about the radical actions of early friends and then experiencing the slowness of change that, some, that it feels like in Quaker meetings at times um, and our, maybe our Quaker business process and, and thinking about how that aligns. Um, and asking myself, am I being impatient um, or have we lost an ability to connect and hear that radical and prophetic call? Um, the tension between urgency and process, um, I think is, is very alive. And I think, um, and like how we want to be grounded and led by love rather than fear. Um, I think about how I experience change in my life and how hard it feels to approach conflict at times and then feel so grateful for the tools that I've learned in Quaker spaces and communities that speak to that uncomfortable space. Um, I'm grateful for the role models of folks standing up against injustice in my meeting, um, for the example of a friend voicing an unpopular opinion in business meeting because they feel spirit moving in a way that I might not. Um, I feel grateful for the notion of um, the light being at times incredibly painful in a searing process like that gives me a lot of comfort of like oh i must be doing something right when it's really painful and uncomfortable um and and i think that's a really helpful reminder as the work that i um, lean into is messy and complicated and um so connected to my identity and, and the work that i need to do i feel grateful for endless quaker mentors who have held me in loving accountability um, to my gifts and the work that we have to do and who have continually asked me questions that help me center in my values. And I feel grateful for uh, a community of practice and support, um, which is a space for deep joy and celebration also amidst um, all of the imperfections um, and, a and, and failures and shortcomings and a way to, to return to that. Okay, I'm gonna try to wrap up. I could really babble about this for a long time, but 
um, I really think that there are a wealth of tools and practices and perspectives that I think are so essential uh, and important and deeply relevant to the societal issues and experiences of injustice today. Um, I think we also, as friends, have a lot of growing edges and work to do um, as to continue our education and reflection and work of listening and looking at our own systems and practices for pervasive pieces of white supremacy culture and racism, um, for ageism and ableism and the ways and other ways that we fall short of uh, in our work of meeting that of God and others and creating welcoming spaces. Um, so I, I'm like thinking about both the assets we have to offer and also recognizing the tools and voices and perspectives that we still need to invite to the table um, that could bring us into deeper alignment with spirit and, and what we might call our prophetic vision and mission as friends. Um, I think there's so much reciprocity and possibility and sharing of tools and practices um, while also at the same time doing our own work um, as, as uh, that accountability, I think, um, builds our, our collective muscles to do the work um, and to listen more deeply to the movement of spirit. Um, yeah, I think that work is really important to me um, and I really invite individuals as they um, reflect um, individually and communally on that, that question of what is mine to do in this moment um, and like what does love require of us. Um, yes, thank you for listening to me rant <laughs> a bit. I'm excited to invite other voices in um, and to see how this might be sitting with others. Thanks. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Marge. And that was not a rant, that was um, witness. And um, I moved, as all of us here, all 205 of us on this call right now or in this video conference are thinking deeply about what you both are saying. Um, Frank Young from Indiana and Spoon River Friends Meeting has written to us um, this question. There's a comment first. Friends believe in the value of all persons, regardless of attributes such as race, sex, ethnicity, ability, age, etc. And these have been historically been used to separate people. To what extent does the future of Quakerism in this country depend on Quakers demonstrating by their activities in their daily lives that they are fully committed to this belief? And I think if you um, have a one and a half minute response, that would be great. I can uh, take a try. Um, I think that's a great question. And my sort of interpretation or, of that might be um, how essential is it that our Quaker um, communities and movements are grounded in um, a justice and equity lens in, in a way that, um, that does meet that of God in um, others and um, yeah, and, and how, how that is integrated into our daily lives. Um, I think it's wildly essential that every Quaker meeting needs to look at our systems and practices and the ways that we are or might be um, exclusive to others um, being a part of this communal space that we're building together. Um, I think um, I'm thinking to Atlanta Friends Meeting, which is my home meeting, um, and feeling so grateful for um, some of the ways that I've seen that happen. And we've been hosting um, uh, bi-monthly forums on how to become a more welcoming and inclusive meeting and have at least three different committees who are actively inviting um, these questions uh, and accountability amongst all of the committees and in business meeting of how do we function out of a lens of racial justice um, being a really important part of our ministry as a community. Um, and so this looks like asking the question, are my restrooms accessible and uh, gender affirming? Um, what, what are the barriers that folks might be experiencing to, um, to get access to funds or support? Um, how are we transparent in our systems? Um, those kind of questions. But I think, um, yeah, the, the part that I might not be hitting is by demonstrating the activities in our daily lives, um, part of the question. So I think, it's, I think it's just really important that we continue that important work of listening to voices that might not even be in the room and, and making space um, um, to recognize where our systems need to, need to shift and, um, 
and yeah, lots of education still. I have a question from Zoom on IMDV. Uh, as a newer Quaker, I still don't understand what you mean by prophetic ministry. Uh, Marge, would you like to comment? Sure. Yeah, I'm on the unit. Um, <laughs> that's one of these questions of the day. Um, when you're looking at prophetic, prophetic ministry, put it in the context when, if you look biblically, you're looking at major figures, particularly throughout the Old Testament, who have unabashed experiences of God in their lives. And God speaking to them and asking them to take on a particular task, which may be really difficult. And you often find them saying, me? I can't do that. And sometimes just being expressing down and out fear but eventually coming to a point where they accept that this that they are to share what they know of god with the world around them to change their society to lead their country in a different direction so it's a very dramatic role and in some ways it's a model of what we're talking about, but I think Quakers have, by saying that every one of us has the potential to hear that divine voice in our heart, that, uh, that guide, find that, own, that, uh, that guidance that some churches leave to the Bible, and if it's not in the Bible, forget it. Others lead, you know, leave it to the priests or the Pope or what have you, that there are different ways. But we, we've said every one of us can convey this, sense, a real sense of what, we don't always call it God anymore, um, but what is that spirit of love and truth teaching us and where is it leading us? And what should we be doing about it? That's where I see it. Okay. Um, we have so many questions coming in. So I'm just letting everyone know on here that we'll do our best. And um, after this, we'll have a chance, I think, to review with Liz and, and Marge a little bit about the questions that we couldn't get to and see how we can do that. Um, we have a question from Jennifer Elam from Me Media, Pennsylvania, who says, I often paint or write or dance to hear what God is saying to me. Soul's creativity is not just a pretty picture to admire. It goes to the core of us in our relationship with God. So I wonder if you could comment on spaces for creativity for friends. I know I was hearing some of that earlier through Quaker practice. You know, how does this build and make room for community building? Um, we can see that there, in my meeting, I know they're like they're a really active group of poets that have just added to the whole community. And they've been meeting together. And then periodically, some, some of what they're saying is coming out in ministry and worship. So you see it filtered through the meeting in that kind of way, as well as in the very small groups that get together. And um, we've had wonderful painters and lots of music lots and lots of music. Anna is one of a couple of people who bring music alive in our, in our worship and, and in all kinds of ways. And then, um, so that's absolutely central, I think, to who we are today. But there's also this creativity, I think I mentioned earlier, in terms of when we gather in worship to make decisions and in worship to look at what, what is our place in our community, in our wider community, what, what kinds of things should we be doing? Or to face disagreements among ourselves. When we are touching into that same heart of creativity, that we can come up with different ways of responding to the world, different ways to solving problems that aren't getting us caught in the either or and you're the, and 
there's only this versus this, but there's a whole new potential, different way of addressing it. And we don't have to follow what society tells us. And sometimes when we're really paying attention, we can see some glimpses of that peaceful kingdom breaking through all the chaos around us. Can I just add on to that? Um, I really appreciate all of what you're sharing, Marge, and I think it, it made me think a lot about, <laughs> um, yeah, just how connected um, creativity, I, how connected I want creativity to be in um, the way we experience spirituality and, and um, how early friends wouldn't define worship as the hour um, on Sunday mornings that we set aside for it, but that we're um, supposed to live lives of worship, and and that um, and that that idea um, of figuring out where you see God or Spirit in other spaces, um, and like intentionally making time and space for that. Um, I'm thinking of QBS fellows are invited to have house meeting for worship once a week. And they often sort of break that up um, to be led by different fellows who are in the house. And their worship practices are so creative and incredible and um, offer so many different ways to connect with spirit. And I think that is something that I'm thinking about, like uh, um, a night of reading to each other from our favorite childhood books uh, for worship, <laughs> uh, a night of um, playing games for worship, you know, of just like all of these different ways to, to to still connect to that divine spirit and and ourselves and each other, um, and just different ways to access that and like it broadens our spirituality rather than sort of diminishing it. And I think um, a barrier that I sense sometimes is like knowing how where the space is to make that happen um, when so traditionally our um, sort of spiritual lives are contained to that hour on Sunday, and um, and so what like what are the ways that I can bring that thing that I'm seeking and make those connections happen and um, invite other people to show up with their spiritual practices and tools that give them as much life as and joy and connection um, and see if that might be something that brings me joy and connection and, as well. And so, yeah, I, I would love, I love the idea of resource sharing of like inviting in new spiritual practices, which is, you know, at intention with tradition and, um, and like the sort of spaces that have also been essential for a long time. So it's a great thought. We had several people who were taken by your, um, your bands in harmony <laughs> example. <laughs> and um, the essence of, of what I'm hearing from several folk are, um, if you could give us examples of some, you know, maybe an example or two of bands of everyday prophets. <laughs> Um, that, I think some of it is the, um, the personality, some of it's personality and meetings each have their own personality. And I think a lot of us can identify with that, that, you know, we really want to know all the specifics. We want to lay everything out and we're going to. Um, be very expansive, but they're very controlled about what we're doing. Anybody recognize that as their meeting? Uh, <laughs> then there's meetings that, all right, let's give it a go and let's uh, improvise here. Let's, well, just because friends always done it this way, let's try. <laughs> but um, you can get very, 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 very different qualities of within the meeting. And um, by recognizing some, some of the nature of what, 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 what is the character of your meeting? What kind of, what kind of band is it? Might help you, and I know when I use this in work, as workshop exercise where some people very disaffected with their meeting, I found it very helpful to sit there and look at their meeting and say, oh, that's what's going on here. <laughs> and I've always, or I've always thought myself as, you know, what the um, part of the uh, string section of the orchestra, but hmm, maybe my place is actually in the rhythm section. 
or if you're in the jazz band, maybe you can do things like cover, you know, you hold the beat for somebody's there holding the beat for everybody and can maybe cover when somebody makes a mistake and readjust the whole tone of what's going on. So there are lots and lots of examples that you can come up in terms of thinking about who is who is my community and how do I work with it and where do I fit into it? And um, as I said, sorry to say, I think I, the, this has been, I've really heard people say when they're at odds with their meeting or their meeting is really being pulled apart, it's been very helpful for them to really use this metaphor to engage with their community in a different way. We're actually at the time of the evening where we're going to go to both speakers and have them um, give their closing statements. And I think Barb Platt has basically said, can you sum up the future of Quakers? She's also thinking it's interesting that we're not discussing the future of Quakerism. So maybe that's going to be a part two. Um, bef before we go on to that, I do want to say to um, Judy Bucci, who said she wants ideas for getting uh, dirt under her fingers for lobbying. Stay tuned because after Marge and Liz speak, Bobby is actually going to take a few minutes to tell us how we can get dirt under our fingers, so to speak, and practice virtu <laughs> virtual lobbying. So um, let's go to uh, Liz first. Can you sum up the future of Quakers in two minutes? <laughs> wow. Let's do it. Okay. Um, no, I, um, it's, it's a great question. And I think um, it's, it's something that feels very dear to my heart, I think, um, in a way that, um, Quakerism has been so nurturing for me, and I feel really grateful to um, have grown up in a community that still um, feels like a spiritual home. Um, and um, I think I, my grandmother was telling me a story um, about her experience as a young adult Quaker, um, as one of the co-clerks of the, I think it was the World Gathering of Friends in 1953 at Guilford College. And uh, like, bless it, that was a long time ago. And she was talking about how um, they were inviting speakers and they had come to consensus as a, a group that they wanted to invite Bayard Rustin as a speaker. Um, and they uh, were supported by older friends and Quaker meetings in the area. And um, and they the, the friends and Quaker meetings thought that that wasn't a good idea. It was too radical. Bayard Rustin was too radical, was too out there doing all these things. And that made me so sad. It made me so sad. And I feel like some of that energy is something that um, it, I still feel in Quaker spaces. And, and so I, I think I, I like want to encourage intergenerational community making and relationships that um, like can help us continue to practice to ask better questions and continue to, to refine and um, think about the ways that um, we can learn from each other and continue to be more inclusive and, and welcoming and build this radical, peaceable kingdom that we're, we're seeking or the beloved community. And I think, um, yeah, the future of Quakerism. Oh, uh, <laughs> I think we have to, we have to center our meetings and our work around equity and justice issues. We have to under, we have to do our work ourselves in order to make change in other spaces. And I think um, Quakers at times, um, some might rest on our laurels of past historical deeds that have been transformative and um, powerful. And I, I think like, what is next? Like what is our next witness that is going to be that big transformative, powerful thing? And what are the tools that I personally bring to that? And, and, um, and how are we each supporting each other and asking those questions of um, what are the gifts that I bring to my community that can help us get to that um, place that we want to build together? Um, yes, so uh, whew, <laughs> lots more. Again, I'll <laughs> let you all know if I write a book. <laughs> <laughs> so Marge, you get to close this amazing evening tonight with your two minute sum up summing up of the future <laughs> yes. of Quakers. No pressure. No pressure. Um, one of the things I've really come to see is there, there's, a, 
there are two really different approaches Quakers take to how they interact with other Quakers, whatever the other Quakers may be in terms of differences from themselves. One is um, what I tend to call purity. People, people in meetings who want us to all be alike in many ways, and they may take a particular issue, whether it be gay and lesbian issues, or you know, on either side, you know, they, they want their whole community to be like that, be pure and do it right. And then there are other communities where they look at the folks that are very different and engage with them and want to see what we can learn from them. And I've really come to believe over the years um, that there is so much that other Quakers that we may on the surface totally disagree with that they may have to teach us and stretch us and if we can engage and build those relationships I think that's absolutely critical. Um, and I could go on for ages about that but what I wanted to do with decided to felt that I should do to share share with you is a letter that I wrote in 2006 that I've totally forgotten about until Christine somehow knew about this. This is a letter I wrote um, that really tried to answer what do adults want for and from junior friends and the teenagers in our meeting. And uh, was published in, uh, with, in Friends Bulletin. Dear friends, at yearly meeting, it was asked what the adults want for and from junior friends. This is my response. I want you to know how God is active in your lives and how God is leading you. Leading you. I want to know that you have a language to speak of the Spirit, words so that you might express your uncertainties and searching, your fears and your delights, your encounters with the divine. I want you to be part of a community where you will be loved and where you'll be safe from physical harm and, and from abuse. In this community, you will still encounter pain and hurt. No one I know is capable of living with others and not hurting them, no matter how much each of us tries. Thus, I want you to learn about the ways of healing and forgiveness. I want you to know hope when all seems without it. Most of all, I want you to experience the reality of unconditional love and grace of Christ, the Spirit, whatever name you wish to give it, that is available to each and every one of us. The love that takes away fear, the grace that gives us the wisdom and courage to live in that life and power which takes away the occasion for all war. Wow. Well, there have been several different um, threads going through the chat, which is, can we please continue this conversation? So I absolutely want to say thank you so much, Liz and, and March, for spending this time and opening our hearts up with you in this topic, the future of Quakers. Um, I do know that Bobby is going to address uh, Judy um, Bucci's question, how do I get my hands dirty um, in uh, maybe a two minute <laughs> fashion. <laughs> and everyone, you will receive the rec this recording. You can follow up with questions. We are very much interested in staying in contact and holding each other at this time for the future of Quakers. Bobby, thank you. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you to our panelists for being really incredible and inspiring tonight. Your words have really touched me and stayed with me. Um, yes, uh, that does conclude our discussion, but we are going to show you a way that you can really easily get some dirt underneath your fingernails by participating in FCNL's Quaker Advocacy and Witness right from home. So um, if you wouldn't mind uh, following along with me, I'll share my screen. But we're going to go to the address that's displayed on the slide right now, fcnl.quorum.us. 
and we're going to do a little tour of our brand new Action Center, uh, which is a suite of online advocacy tools that FCNL has just launched today um, that will really make our already powerful advocacy on Capitol Hill that much more powerful. So I'm going to walk everyone through the process right now. Um, I just need to share the full screen. One moment. All right. All right, has right. so everyone seen the full screen here? Awesome. So as you can see, the, I'm, I'm right at fcnl.quorum.us. So if you want to follow along with me and take an action right now on the next um, COVID stimulus package, uh, follow these steps. I'm going to put in my information right here. Do, do. Uh, this needs to be DC. I'm going to say yes. So I get action alert emails from FCNL and then click submit. And here there's a full tutorial that you can watch on your own time if you want. But what we're going to focus on today is this action alert right at the top, protect the most vulnerable from the impacts of COVID-19. I'm going to click right. And this will take me to a form letter that has all of FCNL's talking points on uh, the federal response to COVID-19 um, and has it all written out for me. And what I'm going to do is just add a few sentences about who I am and why this issue in particular matters to me. What we're talking about specifically is trying to get um, increased SNAP benefits into the next COVID-19 package. And I'm going to copy and paste what I believe as a Quaker on this topic. As a Quaker and a social worker, I believe that everyone is entitled to food and no one should go hungry. Please represent my views as your constituent and advocate in Congress for an increase in SNAP benefits. And just with that little bit of personalization of a message like this, it really makes all the difference for congressional offices. And because I already put my info in, it knows who my representative is, uh, you know, the, uh, Representative Norton for DC, and I can go ahead and just send that right off to everyone. Um, that, there we go. We've got an action taken just now, just that simple. And as you can see, I've just joined thousands of other people in taking that action, which really, it makes a huge difference when it's that many people all contacting our members of Congress about the same policy priority. So if you're looking for ways to get dirt under your fingernails right now, this is a great way to do it right from home. You can learn about a lot of different policy issues on this awesome new tool that we've just launched and start sending some messages to Congress and start making that difference. Um, Thanks so much for uh, hanging with me as I went along on that tour. Um, I think I do have a few more announcements to make. Thank you all so much for uh, sticking with me. But I just want to Judy share... Bucci says that you're her new hero, just to let you know. Oh, Judy Bucci, please email me at rtrice at fcnl.org. I would love to work with you more on anything you'd like to, to work upon. Um, Thanks, Judy. I, yes, I do also want to... Um, Thank you all so much for tuning into this event, but also let you know it doesn't end here. We have a lot of really more exciting um, FCNL virtual programming coming up in just the next couple of weeks and months, actually. So um, another great way to get your hands uh, or dirt underneath your fingernails and really get into some of this witness work is to join us for a climate change lobby training next Wednesday at noon. Uh, you, can, you can sign up for that event um, at fcnl.org slash events, but we'll also send out that link in the follow-up email, so you don't have to worry about that right now. But that's going to be a really great uh, lobby training, teaching you how to put a plan together to lobby your elected officials on um, carbon pricing, which is the climate change solution that FCNL supports right now. Um, also, uh, I hope you'll all stay tuned for an email invitation to our next, uh, our May Quaker Changemaker Series event which will feature a friend in residence at Haverford College, Nozizwe Madlala Rutledge, who's a remarkable peace builder, activist, and policymaker from South Africa. Uh, we also just launched a new bi-weekly chat called Thursdays with Friends, which is um, a half hour chat on different policy issues hosted by our general secretary, Diane Randall. Um, and we have different guests every other Thursday. So I believe next Thursday we'll have Jose Wass on talking about some of the impacts on incarcerated folk um, from this pandemic, which is really, really uh, a huge priority for FCNL, and I hope you all tune into that. Finally, um, we have regular Witness Wednesday Silent Reflection and Worship, which we actually held right before this event. It's every week from 5 to 6 p.m. EDT. 
on Zoom. And um, we would love to have you there just to settle into some worship and community with one another. Uh, we all find it a really helpful practice um, at FCNL. I think that- Bobby, you can find many of these on the front page under events. Is that right? You can. If you go to fcnl.org and scroll down, you can see a full list of our events, or you can go to fcnl.org slash events, and that'll also take you to its own web page that has all of those on there. And we will be sharing all of this information and the links to sign up in the follow-up email that you'll get from registering for this event. So Very I think exciting. that's all from us. Uh, ever faithfully onward we go. I'm wondering if we could pause for just a few seconds to gather in some ground